the warm welcome. We've been out for two weeks. It's been a uh, busy time for you. I know your daily work to keep vaccination services is ongoing, and we want we're back for the COVID-19 Peer Hub. There are no weekly assemblies for two weeks, and now we're getting ready on the 9th of November. You'll be hearing literally more than 2,000 new participants will be joining the COVID-19 Peer Hub to focus on this critical issue of vaccine hesitancy, looking at not observing that hesitancy is out there, that it's a problem, but actually sharing what works, what is working to help vaccination people on the ground make a difference, moving individuals, groups, families, your populations from hesitancy to acceptance. And this is more critical than ever during the pandemic, knowing that there are safe and effective vaccines against COVID-19 likely to be coming out, uh, certainly in the pipeline. Line. Now, we asked you in September, before we get to vaccine hesitancy, we first have to look at what's happened with the impact accelerator. And we challenged you. We said you developed an action plan in August, in the middle of the pandemic, on how you were going to keep vaccination services going on one specific, tangible uh, action that you were going to take. And we said, are you ready to actually take action? And you've spent four weeks doing that. Now, in discussing and preparing this assembly, Charlotte and Boo pointed out, well, we have to recall the four pillars. Remember that you made a pledge. So this is a moral commitment that you chose to make. You, this is you know, above and beyond your daily duties, your, your, your daily work. And that commitment is to achieve impact. It's not only to submit a couple of reports, which is what we're basing certification on, but it's about then sharing that experience, sharing your experience, your successes, challenges, you know, uh, as you go with others. And then, ultimately, the goal is to mobilize, to change things, to exercise leadership. Very pleased to say, therefore, that you know, we work through the stages very quickly. If you look at lightning speed, which I believe is not a luxury during this epidemic. And you can see here that we're now done, as of the 16th of October, with the impact uh, accelerator. And so, we had... 338 Anglophones from 39 countries that were certified for exercise one. That was on the 4th of September. Next, we had 287, so that was 85% of the Anglophones who joined the Impact Accelerator Launchpad. And now we have 244 who met all of the formal requirements for Launchpad certification. Now, let me just be clear, this is not about certifying the quality of the action plans or how much progress you made or certifying that a project has been implemented. It is only about the fact that you participated in the process. And we're going to be looking at the tangible results and outcomes, um, you know, and what they look like now and what they're likely to look like in the uh, near future. So here we have what changed in one month. At the bottom here, you can see the that's the 21st of September. So you can see here at that stage, two weeks after having finished the action plan during the month of August, everyone completed their uh, action plan on the 4th of September, almost a third of you had not yet started uh, doing anything with that action plan. So we challenged you and you made this pledge to achieve impact. And here you can see 62% had started, but hadn't really, com certainly hadn't completed their uh, doing things with their action plans. And then here you can see 8% had already said, you know, what I wanted to do with my action plan, it's done. And that, may, that makes sense in the context of the uh, pandemic. Many of you wanted to take you know, defined action plans that were very specific, uh, very timely, and very quick to uh, uh, to complete. Uh, two weeks in, probably a little more, pro you know, because we were a bit late sharing with you the uh, request for the acceleration report. You can see that by that point, the proportion of people reporting who haven't done anything with their action plan is down to less than one in ten, and four out of five you know, have started and are working on it. Are Setting that weekly objective. What are you going to get done in the next seven days? Uh, did you actually finish what you said you were going to do in the previous seven days? And so on. And a slight increase from 8 to 10% of people who say, okay, I'm done now. And then at the end of the four weeks, 6% of you still haven't made any progress, but still were diligent enough to report on it. And 65% started. You can see that's taken another you know, almost 20% off. And 29% are finished, almost a third, which is nearly the same proportion that hadn't actually started uh, before then. And this is in just four weeks. So 
This is really the, one of the best ways we found to describe what change is produced by the uh, impact accelerator. And if your project is still going on, this says uh, Satab Dimitra, that's fine. A very small scale, but running has been smooth. It's going well. That's wonderful. Again, this process is about your work on the ground. It's not about meeting a course requirement or completing something. Uh, you've done that. You did that with exercise one. This is about actually taking that action plan and running or walking with it at, a, at the pace that makes sense in your, uh, in, in your context. And I'll share a little bit later, once we've gone through the country by country listing, I'll show you what happened in July 2019, the first time that we ran the Impact Accelerator Launchpad, and we'll be able to compare the numbers to see what difference uh, you know, how this kind of process works in a uh, pandemic. I want to turn to Charlotte. Um, Charlotte, I believe you participated in the Impact Accelerator in, uh, as well as Shalini participated in the uh, Impact Accelerator in July 2019. Uh, can you tell us what your, what your recollection is of, the, of this uh, process and what you'd like to say about this, uh, uh, what we are doing today? All right. Uh, thank you very much, Reda. And I just want to say a good morning, afternoon, evening to everyone. It's a pleasure to be back after two weeks of break. You know, I, we missed uh, the COVID-19 Peer Hub family. So concerning the 2019 Impact Accelerator in which I, I took part, uh, it was a great experience because normally in the course, you develop a project as an individual. And usually you're thinking of, okay, uh, at times you, you do it, you're thinking of how am I ever going to get this implemented? So the impact accelerator was an opportunity for me to realize that it is possible to move from the, the, the theory into action. It's possible for move to move from a dream, wanting to change something in your context into real action. And I had the opportunity uh, during that time to, we were able to set up in one month uh, uh, the country group for Cameroon, the Anglophone Scholars, and to be able to hold meetings and come up with a common project, some of which have already been implemented, some of which are being implemented. And the best way I could just conclude this is, uh, is with a quote that uh, it is often said that to go further faster, you should go alone. But with the impact accelerator, realize that together we can always go further and faster. And that uh, what we have, the slide that you're sharing right now, Reda, is actually proof of that. Because in four weeks, moving from 8% completion to 29%, that is going further faster together. Thank you. Thanks, Charlotte. All right, so what do these results look like country by country now? Uh, all right, this is still in French, but that's okay. Uh, these are the certification tables by country. And you can see overall 488 scholars actually completed the requirements, which were to complete, first of all, the qualification um, questionnaire, I believe is what we called it, to qualify for the uh, uh, launch pad. And then uh, to complete two reports, we had initially thought we would do one each week, but that turned out to be unnecessary and we wanted to you know diminish reduce the load uh for participants and so here we are we're not going to do as i said we're not going to do a formal commencement event i'll read through the just show you the countries and then uh alan blessed at Sinku, uh, will be sharing the slides with you so you can look at the uh, results and if you are like maria monzan the only uh, person from let me see if uh, maria is in no she's not uh here today but um you know, 244 Anglophones, so it turned out to be exactly, it's a coincidence, 244 French speakers and 244 uh, English speakers. Maria Monzan from uh, Argentina, uh, three scholars from uh, Bangladesh, uh, one scholar from Bhutan, and you'll see with the Anglophone countries, there are more countries and more countries where there's only one scholar. So I want to especially honor uh, those individuals who had to work alone, who didn't have a country team to rely on, and I also want to recognize and honor the uh, country teams that made such a difference. We see that the countries where you have teams in place that are working, that are meeting on a regular basis, such as Cameroon, you see really impressive results. There's a far larger number of francophones who completed the, uh, uh, the launch pad. Uh, Marie-Ève Burny from the Central African Republic. Um, Solange Santillana from Chile. Uh, Two Anglophones from the DRC, which is actually the largest group uh, amongst the Francophones to have completed the launch pad. Um, one person from Djibouti, Adiela, uh, Ethiopia, two uh, scholars, Gambia, uh, one 
uh, scholar, Al Haji Jabi. Ghana has a very large, very strong country team with scholars organized countrywide, so you can see the names here. Uh, and again, we'll be sharing the full list with you. So if you don't have time to pick out if your name is actually there or not, or if you feel it, sh it should be and it's not, uh, definitely get in touch with us. You know that we, we're always listening and paying attention to uh, your needs. And we wouldn't want to, uh, you know, if a mistake of any kind was made, uh, we would certainly rectify it. From Guinea-Bissau, uh, India, another very large uh, country team, uh, very impressive results from these countries. And again, whether there's one scholar or 50, you know, uh, it means someone in that country, or one or more people were actually trying to make progress uh, to keep vaccination services going during the pandemic. Uh, Kenya, you can see here, another very large uh, team, Liberia, um, Madagascar, uh, so Anglophone from Madagascar, there are many more Francophones. Uh, Mali, the same, Abraham Pudiogo, uh, chose to complete do, his, do uh, the launch pad um, in English from Myanmar, Yin Yin Hate. Nepal, Dipesh Shrestha, Niger, one Anglophone. Um, Nigeria now has two slides because of the sheer numbers uh, of participants who stuck it out, who you know, not only joined the Peer Hub, but actually made it uh, to the end. And you can see the, uh, uh, the list here. Again, we'll be sharing the full list. We're not going to, we have a lot more to deal with to get ready for the next uh, exercise. Uh, so, you know, the team from Pakistan, uh, you can see here the, uh, the, uh, uh, participants who completed the uh, launch pad, uh, Sierra Leone, Slovenia, uh, Somalia, South Sudan, Sudan, Tanzania, Timor-Leste, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. So here, let's have a round of applause. We're not going to do the readings of the names, but a congratulations. This is a step in the process. The, um, the Accelerator launch pad is four weeks in which you set goals you work with your country team, you work with others uh, to really figure out how you're going to reach the objective that you set for your action plan and what concrete steps you're going to take. So let's have, if you'd like to uh, have a round of congratulations. Unfortunately, we cannot open your microphones, but let's, uh, I know that this group would make at least this much applause happen. And let's you look at the questions if you're a team leader or a focal point, have a look going to be turning to you if you want to uh, uh, share, answer these questions. And if you're not a team leader, really want to know what are you going to do after the launch pad? This is really to honor you today before we move on to the uh, exercise two. All right, we have several people who have their, who have raised their uh, their hands. So let's start with uh, Tanushri Mandal, or actually, yeah, and then we have uh, Dr. Samarendra Biswas. Uh, so let's start with Tanushri and then Samarendra. Uh, Tanushri, over to you. Uh, you can take on either the, uh, so if you are a team leader or focal point, we have three questions for you here. I'm going to paste them into the chat. And if you're not, we want to know what you're going to do with your, uh, with your project. Let me just paste those into the chat. So... Everyone can have access to them. Uh, over to you, Tanushree. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Rada. Uh, um, yes, I would like to uh, go for the second one because I'm not the team leader for country India. Uh, so uh, for the next uh, uh, thing, I would uh, like to uh, answer those questions. What progress did I make in four weeks? So yes, uh, my work was on uh, uh, the booking of uh, you know immunization sessions uh, through uh, phone calls. So uh, right now, what I found is that uh, I did an uh, impressive uh, amount of progress in the sense that I devised the module uh, and I was, uh, you know, uh, you know, training the healthcare workers as well as the beneficiaries. Uh, so I had done that. Now I am just doing the post test and uh, trying to, you know, correlate with the pre test and to find out that uh, whether my project did uh, any impact uh, uh, in true sense. Uh, uh, who helped me? Well, uh, I would rather say that uh, Team India scholars really helped me because we used to have a lot of discussion uh, in, in the uh, early part of uh, the uh, Pure Hub. 
and uh, on the other hand i would rather say that uh, since i was also uh, uh, you know interacting with scholars from other countries like uganda as well as uh, tanzania so they also you know on uh, you know occasions when we used to talk so you know certain ideas would uh, come uh, you know while, while brainstorming so they really did help me and uh, overall i would rather say that uh, uh, the coffee uh, you know the remote coffee partners they also helped me in shaping this thing. what lessons did i learn yes uh, i learned uh, uh, to be you know brave and to uh, you know face my, the challenges in life i used to think that uh, well uh, these are somewhat impossible uh, maybe because of the fears i thought that it is not possible or in real uh, real but now you know uh, this is made uh, this has given me the sense uh, that yes we can do it and uh, because the time was very short and i was uh, apprehensive about that so it really challenged me uh, uh, you know to the hilt and you know it brought out the uh, potential out of me i would rather say was there anything that surprised you yes it surprised me in the sense that it brought out the best out of me and i could think i could uh, you know delve into many things uh, and it could bring a lot of ideas in me uh the next uh, action i would like to in my project is to uh, you know uh, make it successful uh, not only uh, in uh, one portion of the country but i want to take it uh, to the next level because that was a piloting phase so i would like to take it uh, to the uh, rest of my uh, state then on a national level apart from that thing what uh, i am doing in other countries like uganda and tanzania in i in i would rather say that in uganda i found that it is quite different because uh, uh, mobile phones is only present in 30% of the population whereas in india it is rather uh, you know uh, contrary we have at least 80% of the people are having uh, you know mobile phones so that was a big challenge how we are going to do that thing so this kind of challenges posed to uh, you know while we were you know brainstorming really helped me to bring out new ideas uh, to uh, go forward is there anything else we need to know yes of course i mean uh, uh, this exercise really helped us uh, you know gave us the guide guidance and you know the true uh, it helped us to uh, explore more i mean uh, i'm a public health specialist i'm a associate professor of community medicine i used to uh, you know look into you know various guidelines that came into uh, but you know uh, 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 you know reading them uh, through the words and understanding that making it work implement in the real sense so i i would say that this really helped me in the process and i'm very indebted uh, i would rather say that all are angels and i'm very happy for that thing thank you very much thank you so much uh, uh, to nushri mandal um all right let's hear from uh, dr samarendra biswas please go ahead yes am i audible yes loud and clear okay uh the thing is that what progress i made in last uh, four weeks uh that uh, in this covid situation this is a new situation uh the thing is that uh, the outreach station was closed in most of the part i i'm working in kolkata as a medical officer so with kolkata municipal corporation we uh and with the help of the government of west bengal the local state government uh we tried to open the sessions which closed during the covid situation and uh the government and with the help of the municipal authority uh it is open in most of the 89% sessions are now open it was totally closed in march april in may it started and in july august it opened but there are many sessions which cannot be open due to a uh, space problem so we have tried to uh, look at the sites where it can be done and another thing that uh, number of footfall that is reduced so uh, ic uh, is done uh, among the common uh, people in the community so that uh, this fear psychosis is over and they and now they have started to come to the session site uh the municipal authority and government is helping us uh, what lesson did, uh, did you learn we oh, have learned that uh in this covid situation the initial fear psychosis was there among the um, vaccinators as well as the 
beneficiaries, guardians. So uh, as the days progress, uh, the number of uh, vaccinators uh, who were afraid, they are working with the ILA, ILA sorry, ILA and sorry, surveillance. Uh, so somehow uh, they have overcome the, their fear psychosis and they are doing the immunization program successfully. So it is our success that most of the outpatient is open now. Uh, was there anything that surprised you? It is that surprised me most is the response, the response of the community. Now they are gathering, but the uh, gathering or uh, overcrowding is a problem now as most many of the guardians who were waiting for so many months for their children to be vaccinated are now coming to the session sites uh, to vaccinate their children. But the problem is that uh, 20 or 30, the staggering approach is there. So they have to wait for that. What is your next action to move your project forward? We you want to uh, extend this project uh, in other parts of this uh, state so that the more of more sessions can be organized within this period because COVID situation is not improving. It is worsening in some parts of Kolkata and adjoining Kolkata, but immunization session should not be stopped. And we have done a calendar for the whole year so that even during the festivals, the immunization session is, was open. The a big festival uh, is just over uh, in Bengal, that is Durga Puja. But in spite of that, the sessions were open during that holiday. Is there anything else we need to know that we want to know uh, how far we can go, uh, you know, how far we can go with our uh, this proposal so that the other parts of the state can adopt this program and our immunization coverage is uh, matched with the previous years. It is 65% less at present. Thank you, Reda. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Samarendra Biswas and Tanushri Mandal. Uh, we have uh, more uh, hands raised. We have uh, Infinix Hot 7 Pro. Could you let us know what is your actual name and unmute yourself, please? And then we have Roger Scani and, uh, okay, Dr. Mohamed Mirza as well. Let's have a, a couple of more people tell us what they're going to do next now that the, the uh, launch pad is completed. As, as I explained, you'll, you will be uh, receiving your... Uh, your uh, whoops, uh, your certificates uh, this uh, week. We're not holding a formal commencement ceremony because we're only certifying that you submitted the three. Basically, you contributed to the monitoring uh, by submitting the qualification and then the two individual acceleration reports. So the uh, requirements are minimal. Uh, the important part of the launchpad is that it helps you, sets you on your way, and there seems to be some evidence from your uh, from your own reporting that many of you have made actually remarkable progress. We'll actually have a control group within a couple of weeks. We'll be able to compare this group with the group that did not participate in the launchpad but also completed action plans, and we'll be able to see if that made any difference. Uh, let's see. Uh, Dr. Mohamed Mirza, would you like to... Uh uh, take on these questions and if there are team leaders or focal points in the room i'd encourage you to remember there's another set of questions just for you uh, about what progress you're making with your country team uh, dr mohammed mirza the floor is yours uh, uh yes uh, thank you i am sure you can hear me loud and clear uh well thank you very much for giving me the platform <coughs> to share uh, uh, my efforts uh, regarding the COVID-19 PNF exercise and later on the impact accelerator. Um, this really revolutionized my work. I'm basically working as district awareness officer in district development in Pakistan. I've been working over here in this position for last uh, almost four years now. <clears throat> what I'm mostly concerned is with the uh, vaccine preventable disease awareness. Special focus will be on uh, AFP and measles. So what happened after the onset of the COVID-19 as it's a global phenomenon now, as you all might recall, 
I mean, the notification decreased. The there there was a reluctance towards uh, uh, coming to the hospital for the treatment for the. Um, I mean, the notification of the VPDs it, it just decreased. And uh, 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 you know, for measles, the non-measles, non-rubella discharge rate, that is a global indicator, and uh, it should be two per one lakh population, and that shows that the surveillance in the community is at par with the global standards. So, alhamdulillah, uh, till now I've been barely able to meet that, but uh, due to COVID-19, it was on the card that I might lose my target, and uh, uh, they and that could give to a. Apprehension that there might be cases in the community which have been missing, so that was the main impetus or rather the focus for my project. And my project was community-based, so focus on community-based surveillance as the masses were reluctant to come to the hospitals on account of fear of contracting COVID-19. <clears throat> Likewise, there was another drawback uh, towards the masses with the vaccine uh, hesitancy, reluctance towards routine immunization. That was another, uh, I mean, uh, imp uh, impedance, and both couple, and uh, um, we were quite afraid that uh, we might be seeing the VPD outbreaks, uh, maybe unnotified and in the community, and that could really dent our targets. So that was the main focus of my challenge, and uh, we prepared that challenge in time, and now that was action time, and <clears throat> our very briefly, very and very quickly, pretty quickly. I would start with the uh, uh, what progress did you make in four weeks? So uh, as I mentioned in my action steps, uh, I started basically a hectic training sessions with all of my town in charges, uh, and in turn they started the trickle down training of all the you know the field supervisors. They were at disposal, and uh, the focus again was on uh, CBS, the community based surveillance uh, for VPDs identification, notification, and. Uh, <clears throat> Simple, tailored, uh, um, uh, um, local language presentations were made, and uh, it was uh, quite motivating to see that there were quite large audiences who attended the uh, presentations. And <clears throat> naturally, my administration, my CEO, my DO, and all you know, they participated and they really motivated and helped me arranging all those meetings. And the lessons I learned that although okay, uh, before the onset of COVID-19. Uh, the notification from the teaching hospitals was quite sufficient, and uh, we were quite, uh, uh, I mean, satisfied. But after the onset of COVID-19, we came to know that there might be some other uh, surveillance method which we were missing initially, which might be helpful in such a scenario. So that was the lesson which I learned that I should be adopting some other alternative means uh, uh, just to improve my notification, and those means should continue in the post-COVID era. I mean. Those are very helpful tools which uh, I was missing and which I started focusing because of the need, uh, obviously, because uh, I was desperate that uh, the notification has decreased and I might be doing something special uh, just to uh, uh, not to miss the cases. So uh, we did different things. Uh, we created different WhatsApp groups uh, and I tailored what even, the t I, I bifurcated the groups into the town groups and I really uh, am involved in all those town groups. Uh, throwing them the notification preference, giving them the memory hammers about the notification, about the measles and all that. And uh, um, again, <clears throat> um, the people were quite reluctant uh, to come to the hospital. So what we did that we went to their houses. We went to the community. I arranged different community sessions with the help of the local people. With the, uh, we, we have a staff in our uh, country. We, we call that national program. We have lady health supervisors. And they control few ladies in the community, which are resident, local resident over there. They visit seven houses per day. They are basically involved in um, uh, mother and child health services. But I utilize them for a measles notification, as you know, it's a quite an age-old disease, and even the elders in the house can easily identify a measles case. <clears throat> so I focus on that as well as um, I am. I have mentioned in my action plan, I was thrilled introduce a tool-free number, but uh, due to the financial constraints, I was not able to do that. So what I did, we had a, <clears throat> a, I mean, a, a very simple uh, local uh, language tailored message for routine immunization and notification of vaccine preventable diseases in major print newspapers. And we gave our number as the local hotline or the helpline, and that proved quite useful as I uh, had few calls where the community members or the masses of the members of the community 
reported that they uh, they, might, they might be fit that the child is suffering from measles. So they thought uh, it is prudent enough to report that case to me. And we had then the blood sample withdrawn from their home, and then we sent that to the reference lab. So the um, I mean establishing a toll free number or rather a WhatsApp number was quite helpful. Uh, what I am uh, I mean the the thing which surprised me is that. Even the minute, simple individual efforts can really make a huge difference. The lesson I learned that uh, not just traditional ways of notification, notification are helpful at times. At times, you have to be very tricky and you have to deviate from the routine. And that might help you in the longer run. Uh, next action move would be I'm planning to ma make short action videos on routine immunization on the importance of measles. And we are going to throw those videos on uh, local cable networks where most of the masses view the cable channels and that might be quite helpful and uh, anything else uh, we need to know well uh, now this is time when I need to know the impact of my actions and I believe that I've done quite a lot and this scholar course has really helped me and really uh, you know um, I've been able to uh, improvise my working the style of my working though the working is very hectic these days due to COVID-19 the contact tracing and all that uh, there are certain additional administrative burdens on my working, but still this course is really helping me uh, excel and really uh, I am I think I'm in a position to really teach the newcomers the um, um, unique ways of surveillance. I know we know the active surveillance, the passive surveillance, the active surveillance, the sentinel surveillance and all that. But I think the, um, the order of the day or rather the uh, in the post even in the post COVID era the community based surveillance is the way forward and I think I've done quite a lot and still I'm not finished I need to get the job done in, uh, and uh, be in touch with all of you and thank you very much for providing me such a platform and uh, interacting with the international scholars I'm learning quite a lot from this platform thank you very much Sridha Thank you very much indeed. I'm just queuing up the uh, comparison that I promised. Uh, thank you for these contributions. So we're past the uh, halfway mark. Um, what I wanted to bring your attention to is, uh, so I showed this in the first part of the, uh, of the session, and you can see we went from 8% who said they had finished their projects to 29% who reported uh, throughout the, uh, uh, the four weeks. Um, let's now go back in time. So in July 2019, uh, so before pre-COVID, uh, we ran the first Impact Accelerator Launchpad. And I know many of you, uh, including the two team leaders who've had their hands raised up, uh, participated in that Launchpad. And I want to show you the comparison because we... we we have both the data to compare to and the control, uh, which we're going to have again by looking at people who did not participate in the Impact Accelerator, who did an exercise one action plan, what happened to them, how did they do? Uh, so just to give you a taste, this is from 2019. So you can see here, it says July 2019. And you can see here that there is 29%, so but roughly the same percentage. Uh, here we have 30% who haven't started, and then we have... 43% who started but haven't finished uh, their uh, uh, their um, course, pro you know, implementing their course projects, and just 1% who say they finished something. After three weeks in the launch pad, you can see that there's 12% who haven't started, and the number of people who have started has gone up to 55%. And now, the, one of the big differences is in the Peer Hub, when we asked you how long will it take you to implement your action plan, the average time uh, was is around three months. Um, with the course project developed pre-COVID, uh, the answer then was 12 to 18 months to implement. So this helps to explain some of the differences you can see here. Um, after six months, we went back to you and we said, well, where are you now? And you can see here that it's now one in eight, almost one in eight who've actually completed their projects. And we're going to go back one year later uh, to actually do the, uh, your 18 months later to do the measurement to see whether people who said they would take them in 12 to 18 months, uh, you know, what happened to them and ask the question, what has been, we asked you the question actually, uh, what has been the impact of the uh, pandemic on your project if you developed a project in the accelerator. So just to show you the kinds of comparisons and what we're trying to understand is what can drive progress. Does this kind of, does working in a network like this one, is it useful to you? Does it make a difference? And this seems to indicate that it might uh, actually make a difference. When we looked at, again, uh, six months after the July 2019 accelerator, I've shared this slide before, I think to me it's quite eloquent. Uh, we, some people 
indicated there might be confounders. We haven't uh, found any uh, at this stage. So in January 2020, we went back. So again, pre-COVID. And the people who had not participated in the accelerator. So this time we had a control group. And of those who had not participated in the launch pad, 44% of them, almost half, had done nothing with their coursework, with their course project that they had developed in a scholar course uh, in, 20, in 2018 or 2019, whereas that was only 5% for those who had participated in the launch pad. And there's some remarkable dynamics that we're seeing again this year where people really got gained a lot by working as a group and we're working as a country team. So we haven't he heard from any team leaders. Unfortunately, we won't be able to because um, I'm very pleased to now introduce the next uh, stage. We have finished the launch pad. You'll be receiving your certificates this week. And now we can move on to the next stage, which where we're going to be working together around vaccine hesitancy. <laughs> this you have seen. You can see that the, um, the announcements for this is actually exercise two. We just thought that telling somebody who wasn't in the peer hub uh, this is exercise two wouldn't make any sense was shared 382 times in less than two weeks remarkable and this is again uh, to the credit of the members of the peer hub who were asked to uh, uh, to share if you felt that this was a worthwhile initiative what this has given us is all right this is still in uh in French, but 2,104 uh, new participants who've been admitted to exercise too. So we did not push recruiting heavily because we have a core group, that's you, uh, who've been working together since July. So we wanted to find the sweet spot between new people and you know having enough people who have shown that already demonstrated their diligence and commitment. But that's more than a thousand uh, Anglophones who are going to be committing to exercise two, focusing on vaccine hesitancy. And this is again when I want to turn to you. This time I'm going to lower the hands that are raised because we did this uh, in the final week of the uh, launch pad around the 16th of, before the 16th of October, um, the week on the 12th of October, I believe. We ask these questions, and this is in a nutshell going to be the core of the exercise. So really, I'd like you to think, if you haven't already of a time when you helped an individual or a group overcome their initial reluctance, hesitancy, or fear about vaccination. And what we'll be doing during the exercise, there's a very clear schedule uh, that's outlined here uh, that I hope all of you have looked at. If you've decided to participate in exercise two, uh, it will be onboarding and orientation. So onboarding is mostly for newcomers, if you are made it through exercise one, you understand how this works. You may not need to uh, participate in the onboarding activities. Orientation is quite important. This is where we're going to get to know each other and welcome new people to the, uh, uh, to the second exercise. And then we'll be going through the uh, uh, peer review you development process. So develop this time a case study. One time when you manage to help someone overcome their initial reluctance, hesitancy, or fear of vaccination. Uh, week you'll be submitting at the uh, on the 4th of December. In week three, the week of the 7th of December. So we're moving towards the end of the year. In some countries, it's also moving close to the end of your uh, uh, vacations and festivities. Uh, so in week three, we'll be doing peer reviewing. And by then, we hope to be able to work with some of the key partners in this space uh, to explore prospective scenarios around the future rollout of COVID, vac COVID vaccines. So we have very safely and cautiously focused the peer hub on you know, the urgency at hand, which has been, you know, keeping vaccination services going or resuming vaccination, doing catch up and so on. But we know that the stakes before us for anyone working in immunization right now you know, is sooner rather than later, we hope, going to be about new vaccine introduction. And so even though we don't, we may not have all the characteristics of the vaccines that will be used in various countries, um, we know enough to build some perspective scenarios to help think through individually and collectively in country and between countries what that future rollout looks like. And there's also an opportunity potentially for people who participate in these scenarios to then become, to be able to contribute to their country's effort as different countries ramp up, probably not on the same schedule, uh, their, uh, uh, their 
their rollout of uh, the uh, COVID uh, vaccine. So um, I want to challenge you now with these questions. This is basically, these are the questions that we'll be asking uh, in the case study. And think about how much you can learn by reading how other people have answered these questions and about reading and, and thinking about and sharing and discussing these different types of situations in different countries across different contexts. Uh, Going to be looking for volunteers, of course. So if you haven't already, we're especially interested in hearing uh, from people who have been shy in the past, who may not have had the confidence. But if you're still here, you made it through exercise one, you made it through the uh, peer review exercise, you made it through the uh, launch pad, please, you know, we want to hear from you. We know some people really love uh, public speaking in, in this kind of space, and we appreciate uh, their diligence and their constant presence and contribution, but we'd really love to hear some, uh, uh, some voices uh, that we have. Perhaps uh, if you have never spoken in a session like this, uh, would love to hear you uh, speak up uh, to tell us about a situation when you convince someone, an individual or a group, to vaccinate Maybe it was one child, maybe it was many children, uh, maybe it was adults, in fact, uh, who needed it. We know with COVID, obviously, adult vaccination is going to be a big, uh, big issue. Um, so, Cecilia, you have just identified uh, yourself. Let's see, uh, I'm hoping that your connection is good and that you're able to unmute. I'm asking you to unmute if you'd like to contribute and answer these questions. You can see them in the chat if for any reason you're unable to see them uh, here, all right, and we're going to need some uh, volunteers. Let's have a little music while everyone's thinking and considering these questions. Uh, and we, we'll wait until we have some uh, some hands raised. All right. Thank you, uh, Roger Scanny. We'll be coming to you in a minute. Let's see if we have any. Any takers, anyone who has not, who we've never heard from in this space. Now, Rogers, don't be, don't be shy. If, if you, uh, <laughs> that doesn't mean we won't uh, ask you to, uh, uh, to share if no one else uh, is up. But we really want to give a chance to uh, people that we haven't heard from yet. As we are more tightly knit than ever, we've been through quite a lot together uh, and been connected in various ways. And this is really the work that we'll be doing in exercise one. Let's go to Rogers then. All right, Rogers. Okay, good evening, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good night. Good afternoon, everyone, wherever you are across the world. Um, I'm Rogers. I'm calling from Nigeria, Niger State precisely. Um, because no one wants to <laughs> volunteer, I know I've shared my experience on this before. But I, I want to share another scenario where I also had similar experience and uh, together with team, we curtailed the vaccine hesitancy in a school. Uh, in Port Harcourt then, I was WHO LF. So during a campaign, a polio campaign then, so there's a particular school around Port, somewhere in Port Harcourt, around Orazi Axis, that refused to vaccinate the school children. So what we did was to call some stakeholders from the Basic Education Board. Immediately they came. So because the Basic Education Board is responsible for giving license to schools. So they now said, look, we have an MOU with the Ministry of Health that during campaigns and vaccinations will ensure that schools allow their pupils to get vaccinated. So because the, the stakeholders from the school board were on ground presence and the school knowing that they may lose their license if they don't permit us to, uh, don't permit the vaccinate, uh, vaccinators to, come to vaccinate their children, that it may cost them losing their license. The school now said no, that they need to inform their parents, the parents of these puppies, and get the consent of the, the parents. So we gave them one or two days to do that because prior before the campaign, we've given notification to schools, we've given notification to churches as well. So, but this particular school tried to prove stubborn in the some way and they've been uh, there have been history about that this particular school not accepting uh, vaccinators to vaccinate their 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 puppies so uh, with, after two days time we still call the stakeholder from the school board to come together with us so we went there and they allowed us to vaccinate the children so in essence the key experience here is sometimes 
yes, um, um, approval is needed from parents, but some overzealous schools and some school proprietors wants to a kind of swat the state policy on vaccination. Vaccination. So you, the best way is to use the relevant agency that gives um, that gives license to such schools or such uh, authority or such churches to to instigate or ensure that the children are vaccinated. So the best thing what we pick out from there is yes, it is essential that the health team, the health key players in the health sector are involved in vaccination, but to get a holistic and comprehensive vaccination, there is need to involve other key players like the school management board, the church uh, authorities, the religious bodies, those that approve or give license to establishment of uh, uh, schools and churches where people will need vaccination. So that, that's one of my experiences. I know the, the other time I shared experience about an individual where we have to use a local interpreter and uh, uh, someone from the tribe to engage in. So that's that my experience. And there are so many other experiences, but please no one wants to speak. So let me share this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rogers. That's much appreciated. All right, we have another volunteer who's Vinay Bai. Um, I want to go to uh, Francois Gas before we hear from Vinay. Uh, uh, Francois, what would be your questions to Rogers? What else would you need to see? So right now he's speaking to us about his experience, but to make... Uh, uh, a good quality case study to really understand what was the situation, what happened, how it turned out, who did what, what were the, uh, you know, what was involved. Uh, would you like to, you know, what would be your additional questions? And we're not going to ask Rogers to answer them, but just to consider what kinds of questions, uh, what kinds of things he should think about uh, in order to build that case study when we kick off the, uh, once we kick off the exercise next week. Uh, thank you, Reda. I'm, I'm not 100% sure how we dig more. Thank you, Rogers, for presenting. But I think the more we got detail on the background, because some information came afterwards that the school was already a special school that had problem in the past, and they used to be dissidents from the normal system. And so I think it's it's important in the background to be very specific on what is the case, the details on what really was the case based on his, his, his uh, experience with the school. Uh, it was they refused, there was special reason for them to refuse. Uh, did, does he know them or he discovered them afterward or he assumed that the schools are, was, uh, you know, just a very special school. There is always some rebels uh, among individuals or uh, or entities, you know, they can they disagree with the rest of the system, but it's a nice uh, it's a nice story. But you need more about what was the school, what was special about that school, uh, why did it behave like it behaved in the past and uh, now? Was it a surprise to see the school refusing the vaccination of the kids? And uh, what was learned from the past about previous similar issues? I think it's important to dig in the challenge that you saw in more details to fully understand what you had to address and you had to resolve with different techniques. I was a bit uh, wondering, and you know, when you, I think if I pick it up, you know, I would need to dig and to be next to you and discuss to understand more. Uh, I have many more questions, but when I hear that using the authority, uh, making a threat that they would license if they disagree. I, I'm never sure that uh, when you put such a pressure, it worked. <laughs> but I would always hesitate. But, it's, you know, maybe it was wrong to hesitate. I wonder if there was, uh, why did you choose to use authority? Did you think that you would not uh, got it through without, uh, you know, with a threat? Uh, of losing of losing the license and they only obey not being convinced but just because there was a threat uh, what was the role what what was the role of the parents with that school you know school and parents you know some schools uh, have recruit people who are in a special world and agree on certain things because they seems the school uh, needed to convince the parents so the parents were very happy with the schools and I would love to know more of the parents 
Why did they agree in a school that was different from the others? Maybe a better school than the others. Maybe the children were highly performing. So there was a trust between the school and the parents. And even it looked like the school say, we need to talk to parents before you move. I found that extremely interesting. But the more detail you will give about the situation, the better we will understand your solution, the risk of the solution if you had to, uh, why did you choose that approach? Or where you impose the approach from the authorities? Did you look for it? And what was the true impact in the, there is a short term and there's a long term, a long term issue. Would you have to redo it each time there is a new vaccine? Uh, you have to go through it. If a COVID vaccine uh, uh, come in, do you think you will face a problem with that school again? So I have many questions. I think it's a very interesting case study. And the more you will provide details, what you, the options you choose and why you choose those options, the better it will be for everyone, I think, to understand. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. So we're not going to ask Rogers to answer any uh, or all of it, much less all of these questions now. But just to give you a sense of what kinds of things we expect you to wrestle with and think about and ultimately write up in a case study that you will then submit for peer review and that you will then revise and finalize at the end of the four weeks. So uh, by that point, we will be mid-December. Uh, all right, we've only got eight minutes left, and there's actually a really important uh uh, section. So I, with apologies to Vinay Bai and Glory, and uh, actually turned out there's uh, and Samuel and Mohammed uh, and Galaxy Tab A uh, who have raised their hands. We're going to have to move on uh, because we have something very important, and it is here. It is that we have more than 1,000 Anglophones. We're going to be starting exercise two. More than 800 of them are completely new to scholars. So they have not been in the Peer Hub. They have not taken a scholar course before. When we saw this, we were really surprised to see this many new people. This is a credit to the, you know, to the, to the way in which active members of the Peer Hub have been sharing uh, the information. And this is why I want to talk about breaking bread together. So some of you, actually quite a few in this room who have been, who are long-term, long-time scholars who were who've been with us since 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, or even those who joined this year for Teach to Reach, um, we've broken bread together. And this is the meeting of accompaniment, uh, accompagnement in French, which is about sticking with a task until it's deemed completed, not by the person who's you know, helping you along, but by the person who is receiving the uh, uh, the help. So he started in 2017, 2018. Uh, we saw that many scholars were helping each other. And we thought, well, there's something quite remarkable going on here in terms of solidarity and support in the same way we do it in a very structured way with peer review. Well, we saw scholars helping each other spontaneously. And so for those of you who are here, in the room, and we have over 140 people, 141 who are, who are here right now, so that's about a little less than half of the people who completed the launch pad, so we know we're missing quite a few, but uh, we hope they'll watch the uh, video and we'll certainly reach out to them. But if you're here, you're, the most, you're amongst the most committed and diligent. And these are the questions I'd like you to ask yourself. Um, do you feel ready to help others in using you know, the scholar system in, in being in the peer hub and doing things in the peer hub and getting that exercise done. Uh, do you feel ready to support someone else? If someone who may be different from you in a different country or in your country from a different level of a system, someone who is a doctor and you're not a doctor or, or vice versa. Um, do you also feel ready to set clear limits? So you're not just available 24 seven. Are you, uh, do you also feel ready? If you want to help, we need to know what's happening with that help. So, you, you know, to ask you to report on uh, what is happening with the help and the support that you're providing. Uh, these are some of the questions you'd like to we'd like you to uh, to ask yourself. And this happens spontaneously with the francophones. If you do feel ready, uh, please type yes into the chat so we can see it. Make sure you're sending to panelists and attendees because we're going to be inviting you to uh, support. Uh, new scholars. We've got a large group that is going to be there on Monday. We deliberately wanted to keep this session. Got over 800 new people who are going to be, new Anglophones who are going to be joining. And we wanted to make sure that we had at least one session 
with this group. We have been working together since July, at least. And many of you, of course, are alumni of the WHO Scholar Courses, of the Teach to Reach program, and so on. So here's what we'd like to invite you to do, is to serve as an accompanist. And in order to explain what that means, we have several people in the room, including uh, people who are now team leaders. Uh, you can see we'll be sharing the slides with you so you can go through this um, you know, on your own time. I'm not going to read through them with four minutes left on the clock. It's much more interesting to turn to you. Um, there's very specific things that accompanists can do during onboarding, during orientation to help people along. And um, we know, you know, we asked this question, well, does accompaniment, this idea that a scholar says, yes, I'm ready to help someone else. I'm ready to help someone who is new to this scholar system, doesn't know how it works. You know how people are, especially in the first couple of weeks. Some people, we give them very detailed tutorials, and we don't really know if they watch them or not, but they still, they're still confused. They still say, they're still crying for help and saying, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing or how to do it. Uh, we send them detailed step-by-step -step instructions and still they say, I can't, uh, you know, I can't, something's not working, something's not right. And then finally, they get somebody on the line, usually Alain Blest at Cinco uh, in the recent past. Um, and... In 10 minutes, they say, now I understand. That's the difference that an accompanist can, uh, uh, can, can make. And if you decide to serve as an accompanist, I see many yeses in the chat. Uh, that's what we'll be asking you to, uh, to do. As I know that there are many uh, distinguished and uh, highly qualified and experienced uh, accompanists in the room, if you have served as an accompanist, I'd like to ask you to raise your hand and share your experience and we'll finish the meeting that way. We'll be following up by email with more instructions for those of you inviting you to serve as an accompanist in the coming uh, upcoming exercise. Many of you have received support from uh, fellow uh, scholars who served as accompanists. So I think there's many of you who know what this is about. Uh, you've been a bit shy today in terms of uh, raising hands. I know there's connectivity issues in many countries right now, but please, if you would like to... Okay, yes, Halima. A warm welcome to you. Uh, please, we would love to hear, uh, to have you share your experience. I hope you can... Your connectivity... Yes, wonderful. Welcome. Hello? Yes, we, we hear you loud and clear. Good evening and good to be back with uh, to the community where we are comfortable sharing ideas, learning from each other. Uh, as an accompanist, it has helped me in so many ways to help others. I have equally helped myself and I'm a better person than I used to be before I joined the scholar community. Uh, my work is not the way it used to be. The, my perception concerning immunization completely has changed and I am doing better by the day and in helping others. I find joy in, in helping others because I equally help myself and I get better knowledge as I do to others. I think basically that is what I have stand to give in this program. Helping others, mentoring them and equally helping myself too to gain better understanding. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Halima. And yes, when we saw these numbers, when we saw how many new people are coming into the COVID-19 Peer Hub, we said we have to call for a company support. Uh, to close this meeting, I'm going to ask... Um, Dr. Alan Blestat Sinku, uh, in a way, he is he has been a companist number one. He was part of the first cohort where he really went out of his way to help others, and we saw this and we said, "Well, wait, <laughs> you know, if if there is that solidarity, there's that willingness to help each other, then let's support that and recognize that and honor that." Alan, would you like to tell us why would should someone serve or not as an accompanist? What would you want to say there? Thank you. Good afternoon. Good evening, Reda. Once again, thanks everyone here. Uh, and then, first of all, congratulations if you're here uh, for all the long work done, the long the work of uh, your passion, expressing your passion, wanting to go above and beyond uh, your workload, your daily workload, and uh, really want to express your. So, Reda, for well, responding to you, accompanies mean uh, sharing the bread. So when we share, when you share the bread, you have two halves of your bread. So two per, two people are eating that bread that we share. That is accompanied from Paul Farmer. So 
being an accompanist means really to learn. You support a scholar because you want to help a scholar to express the passion. You want to help a scholar to help the country is working for, help the scholar because you understood that minimization is not just a country or a town. It's about the world we are living in. And the COVID-19 is reminding all of us that we are all living in the same big village where epidemic and all those pandemic, they don't have borders, they don't have colors, and they just hear. And if you want to face them, let us have they are doing. Let's be that big village. And the scholar community is a nice place to start.